all for more means more for all. If it can be made, it can be used. And if it can be used, it can be made. History is bunk. Half the time equals double the yield. War is bad for business. As select alphas, conditioned to believe without knowing and to know without believing, you have been chosen to view the surrogate revelations and synthetic mysteries upon which all perfect and placebic belief is founded. Here before you are sacred teletime plex relics of the sanctified life, thought, and holy works of our four, from whose divine inspiration came the ultimate perfection of the endless assembly line, which has given us the ultimate endless, perfect happiness of more things, for more wants in perfect balance, with more wants for more things. Doesn't want to get involved Do not disturb Do not disturb I like it when you tell me All of my problems can be solved But do not disturb oh, no, no. Do not disturb People long ago didn't want to know And so they took him there and they killed him there And they were just like you I guess I like the easy ways of just sitting Do not disturb To think I'd shed my own cocoon Doesn't make much sense How absurd Oh no, no Do not disturb So recently I watched the 1980 made-for-TV version of Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, <laughs> and I wasn't necessarily intending to watch the whole three-hour production, but I kind of got pulled in and wound up being pretty staggered by how many facets of this uh, well-known dystopian uh, novel you know, relate to things going on in the headlines uh, right now, and I'd been you know, familiar with kind of the basic premise and, and a lot of the elements of this futuristic depiction, you know, such as just the pretty obvious themes of a technocratic society that's fueled by pharmaceuticals and, you know, cradle to grave programming and uh, rigidly enforced social classes and, and all the, these kinds of things, you know, I, but I hadn't really ever read the, the story or, or seen any depiction of it. So watching it now, 
I kind of wasn't expecting to be so jarred by the things that jumped out as, as being the most disturbing or kind of the more the more subtle things, I, I suppose. As I'm sure plenty of you already know, in Brave New World depicts a future where sex and sensuality is, is used as part of the control uh, mechanism and uh, promiscuity is actually not just encouraged but enforced by, by law, basically. And so sleeping with a different partner every night is considered just as much of a civic duty as rolling up your sleeve is considered part of your civic duty to uh, many people today. And so everyone's uh, sexual activity is tracked and traced in order to prevent them from being with the same person too many times in one month and to prevent anyone from developing a strong bond with any one particular person. Everyone is said to belong to everyone else, so the saying goes. So no one has to be alone. And that facet alone is makes for a pretty terrifying prospect of a future indeed. But the whole enforced system of Borg-like sexuality is not even possible still without the all-important use of the drug Soma, which is it's used as a form of mind control and almost kind of more of a currency even, where it's like a recreational drug at certain doses, but also a crowd control method or a euthanizing agent in higher doses. And so in short, Soma is the central weapon that is employed by the totalitarian state painted by Huxley. And so the whole theme of Soma uh, struck me particularly again in this this time of history that we're in and so just pondering the the idea of soma today in itself could we could spend a really long time doing that both in the the very kind of obvious ways i mean obviously pharmaceuticals are a big part of uh, society uh, in many ways you know both on the street and in the ever encroaching public health nanny state but even in a more kind of metaphorical way you don't have to think about it very hard to realize that soma can mean so much more than uh, chemicals that are affecting people's mental states. But essentially anything that functions as a way of distracting you from reality and putting you to sleep and numbing the pain and the disillusionment and whatever. These do not have to be pharmacological related things. You know, how much soma does just the media in Hollywood churn out on a daily basis. But also the church, the church of our Ford or Fordism, uh, I thought was incredibly fascinating as well, because at first glance, that might seem kind of silly, like a silly thing to kind of create a whole false futuristic civic religion around, you know, Henry Ford and the, the assembly line. But um, even that too, if you just change the little T symbol that they make, like the sign, it's the sign of the cross, but it's supposed to represent the model T. You know, just change that T to a P today. I mean, how many people today, when you really think about it, have essentially incorporated a religious level belief in the mass production of these synthetic compounds, these nanoscale synthetic proteins and molecules and alleged mRNA sequences and all these things that can now just be mass produced just like the Model T was, you know, a hundred years ago. No big deal. But people trusting it and believing in that and in a way where they're saying, yeah, this is part of God's <laughs> God's plan for, for mankind is so just change Ford to Pfizer and, you know, you kind of get the idea. And that blew me away. But the whole history of not just Aldous Huxley, but of course his brother Julian and his whole family, going back to his grandfather Thomas and his connection to Darwin himself, and this whole, you know, humanist intelligentsia world that he grew up in, and just even the broader arc of utopian and then dystopian novels, of which Brave New World is kind of heralded as the first dystopian novel, which he wrote in pretty much a direct response to the utopian novels of individuals such as H.G. Wells, who is like the grandfather of science fiction, right? It's one of the most heralded science fiction authors of all time, and yet it's interesting when you look at like which books, which writings of H.G. Wells are household names and everyone's heard of them and thinks of them, like The Time Machine and uh, The War of the Worlds and things like that. We, we've all heard of that, and yet there's a whole litany of utopian and socialist futurist uh blueprint type writings that he wrote that never seem to get any attention 
For instance, Wells wrote The Open Conspiracy, Blueprints for a World Revolution in 1928. Uh, he wrote The Shape of Things to Come in 1933 and the just blatantly titled New World Order in 1939. So, not to say that H.G. Wells uh, coined that phrase, but he certainly helped popularize it as a description of a one-world scientific dictatorship. Which was what all the all these different books and, and reactions and of course uh, Orwell's 1984 was kind of a response to Brave New World uh, itself and uh, Huxley you know kind of it was just this this back and forth conversation kind of a thing over the over the decades of the entire 20th century of you know what's utopian and what's dystopian but they're all premised within the same basic evolutionist uh, scientific framework. And that kind of became very apparent to me as I kept watching this movie and it gets into where John Savage, who was born outside of the outside of New London living with the Savages, but his father, who was played by the guy who same guy who played Dave Bowman in two thousand one. Uh, his father was an alpha and his mother was a beta who gets she gets injured and left and just left there in the in the wastelands, and so John Savage is, is born and reared and is reared among them but he he's educated by reading uh shakespeare and i think a scientific journal supposedly too but in the movie they just kind of show this this book that it looks like a like a bible basically you know it's kind of like his one prized possession there and so all throughout the movie john savage is just quoting shakespeare which you would think would be pretty annoying, but it somehow actually kind of works. And uh, I was surprised by how much I found myself kind of identifying with, with the character of John Savage and really kind of wanting to see, like, well, you know, what's going to happen to this guy? And so the whole, the, the term Brave New World is, is he's quoting from Shakespeare from The Tempest. Be like Miranda, find a new wondrous world. <laughs> oh, what wonder! Any goodly creature there be. How beauteous mankind is. How lovely and fair and. Are you married to her? Am I what? Married. Thus joined, let two souls be as one. You understand? Forever. Hear the words they speak mean that forever. Wait, no. A brave new world. Such people in it, and so it's it's kind of tongue in cheek in a way because he's he's naive to what is really awaiting to him, and when he gets there and, and sees like how disgusted they are by the idea of monogamy or the idea, even the words mother and father are like profanities and not even so much censored but just everyone is so programmed to, to despise the idea of family in any way that was kind of one of the most horrifying parts of it i think compared to to right now like how much closer we are getting to that on a a, a cultural societal level without even being this this far into a technocratic super state or whatever it was amazing but he's kind of being paraded around by uh, his kind of sponsor, Bernard, you know, who, who's kind of like letting him be used a, as an experiment and everything. But John Savage just becomes disillusioned and disgusted by everything he, he sees. And so by the end of it, he just wants to go be left alone by himself. He doesn't want to go to some exiled uh, island with all the other free thinkers because he's he's so he's just so sick of all of it. And even then, he can't be left alone because they secretly film him and make a little documentary. And so people from New London keep coming out to, like, gawk at him and, and all this stuff. And it causes a riot, which they put down with Soma, and a bunch of people die. <laughs> and the, the book and the movie do not have quite the same ending. They kind of changed it a little bit to be more of a, like, a Romeo and Juliet kind of thing where he finds her after the, the Soma and thinks that she's thinks that she's dead, but she's not. And so he goes and hangs himself, and then she, um, and then she gets taken off and reprogrammed or killed or whatever. So it's kind of definitely a, a tragic ending that kind of leaves you going like, why did I just spend three three hours watching this? And uh, but that was kind of the whole takeaway. It was like, okay, so this is the big. When you put this all back into the the broader context again of of the arc, not just of these writers, but of the arc that we as kind of like the the mass of society have followed. 
as all these things have now kind of played out in the real world, all the the attempts of enforcing these scientific dictatorships and, you know, different versions of socialism and centralized government and, and automation and technocracy and all these things, communism, you know, by whatever other name. You know, Huxley himself writes this piece and it does feel very, um, like he's genuinely repelled by a, a lot of these consequential horrors that, that he sees, which H.G. Wells, you know, would never even explore, right? And so he continued to kind of grapple with this up until his death, and he wrote um, A Brave New World Revisited, which has an extremely interesting a foreword, a new foreword that said, If I were now to rewrite the book, I would offer the savage a third alternative. Between the utopian and the primitive horns of his dilemma would lie the possibility of sanity. In this community, economics would be decentralist and Henry Georgian. Politics, Kropotkinesque and cooperative. Science and technology would be used as though, like the Sabbath, they had been made for man, not, as at present and still more so in the brave new world, as though man were to be adapted and enslaved to them. Religion would be the conscience and intelligent pursuit of man's final end. The unitive knowledge of imminent Tao or Logos, the transcendent Godhead or Brahman, and the prevailing philosophy of life would be a kind of higher utilitarianism in which the greatest happiness principle would be secondary to the final end principle. The first question to be asked and answered in every contingency of life being, how will this thought or action contribute to or interfere with the achievement by me and the greatest number of other individuals of man's final end? And uh, I thought that was absolutely fascinating because indeed, that's a great question. What are we doing? To, what does that final end mean? And again, that's where if you go back to what is your starting point for that question, if you're still within the paradigm of, you know, a cosmos that just created itself out of nothing somehow through an explosion and there's Darwinian self-assembly of life and, and uh, you know, order out of chaos, you know, evolution essentially is order out of chaos. It's, it's more than just a dialectic kind of social engineering device. It's, it's literally what you believe everything is. But um, so, yeah, he starts turning to spirituality and, and drugs and psychedelics. And he, you know, he writes The Doors of Perception. But in 1958, he's still concerned about overpopulation and all these things. So he's, you know, unsatisfied, you know, wanting, <laughs> there's got to be more, there's got to be an answer, there's got to be an, a third way, a third alternative. And the idea of a community where, oh, it's decentralized and, you know, science and technology is to be used as being made for man and not man for, you know, like the Sabbath. I mean, that's, hopefully you can understand why, like, that is going to make sense to a lot of people. And this is why... Huxley is very interesting and unique in the, in this whole conversation because he kind of marks really the, the, the path that so many people end up taking when they come face to face and they wake up from, you know, whatever their soma was or whatever their, their path was. And you kind of see that, hey, like this whole brave new world thing, this new world order thing isn't just some dumb conspiracy or something in a bunch of science fiction books, but it's actually... These are the writings of these children of scientism uh, for a long, long time, right? All these little pupils of scientism and, and humanism, right? What, which is kind of fascinating, going back to the whole idea of Shakespeare being, like, the furthest thing back. Like, that's that's the, the whole concept of, of spirituality and soul and, and poetry and, you know, all these things that we feel like are just kind of being squeezed out of modern society and modern life more and more all the time and the sanctity of the individual is just being crushed and drained and commodified and, and all this so it, it kind of represents yeah you turning back to this vague yearning for history and and art and the humanities whatever but if it never goes back to god it's all just as empty and just as as kind of nihilistic in in the end but Huxley's last book that he wrote before he died in 1963 was just called Island, published in 62. And it, so he essentially writes out a story that he described there in that foreword of some guy going to an island, you know, which is a very common theme in all these utopian books, you know, going back to Bacon's New Atlantis and such. Or even uh, Thomas More's Utopia, which was published 100 years before New Atlantis, which is fascinating in itself. But written by Thomas More who's kind of a pre-Jesuit Jesuit, but published posthumously after his execution uh, by Erasmus. So, But in some ways, the main character of, of Utopia, Thomas More's Utopia, resembles 
John Savage in Brave New World, ironically enough. It was self-flagellation and, you know, whipping yourself and, and all this stuff. Very strange. But in Island, 1962, basically, it's about a guy, he, he goes to, to this community, with this decentralized community where technology is used, but it's all in balance and people have more time for leisure and they have all this freedom. And it's, it's kind of going back to like what H.G. Wells describes in his very first kind of utopian novel in 1923, titled Men Like Gods where there was no world government, but there essentially the government was just the education of everyone and the enlightenment of, of everyone. And so it kind of involves just a bunch of uh, discussions about, you know, monistic spirituality, and there's there's like a an ayahuasca-type drug experience, and then they wake up, and the totalitarian country next door is basically about to take them over. And so it kind of ends with just as much of a hopeless question as Brave New World did, and then, and then Huxley's gone, so... And so, yeah, after thinking about all this stuff for the last few weeks, even, it's amazing how much, how many parallels just kept jumping out at me each day after watching this. Especially now where the, the whole right-left paradigms are just getting more and more ratcheted up. This culture war and uh, over issues that are very real issues, and it's not, and, and I'm not trying to, like, sidestep any of them to just say, oh, it's all, it's all part of this dialectic, so being pro-life doesn't matter and caring about your country or caring about, you know, what's actually happening in the world where you live, whether it's economically or, or that. It's, these things absolutely matter. But at the end of the day, if you don't actually have a hope that it goes beyond the hope of this character, if there is no creator behind not just our existence, but if there's no redeemer for what has befallen the human race, namely sin, and there is no resurrection of the dead, to where, you know, you, you actually have eternity with Christ where sin can no longer be allowed to exist. And it really is all the things that, that fallen men have tried to imagine about creating a utopia and creating the ideal society can never do anything but just create a dystopia. That's kind of the whole takeaway, I, I think, is what history shows us again and again, is that no matter what we try and do, the reality of sin just takes over and creates a, a nightmare of one kind or, or another. Uh, you know, creates all manner of distortion. You know, all, all manner of just inventing ways to, to do evil. And so, ultimately, I, I kind of came away going, you know, there's, there's two falsehoods that this movie represents. I mean, in a very emotionally connective way. But I would say it's the, the feeling of hopelessness that because there is no God allowed into the equation, and uh, John is is alone. You know, he's he's alone throughout the whole thing, and that feeling of of isolation and and being the only one who you know see. <laughs> That's what I think is most compelling about this whole story is you really kind of see the world through John Savage's eyes, and it, either you get it, you either relate to that by walking around in the world that you live in, or you don't. You probably think it's really really dumb story. But ultimately, Aldous Huxley just turned to the same thing that so many people today are turning to in their yearning for something deeper and yearning for a hope that goes beyond just what consumerism can bring them or just constant sexual indulgence can bring them or, you know, material prosperity or, or, or whatever, having achieved, you know, whatever measure of success in society you hope to achieve. And it's a very painful process of waking up to a world that has already incorporated so many of these ills and these evils and these eugenics-based ideologies and methodologies, and especially now that technology has now reached such a, a stage where at least you know the media is debating if, if AI could be sentient, and for the record, I don't believe that AI will ever become sentient, but I'm just fascinated by the fact that they're talking about it. This, this Google engineer just is making all the rounds. He was on Tucker and all these places, and they're having this silly conversation about this AI bot who's supposedly like an eight-year-old child, and uh, it's just getting weird. Elon Musk is visiting the Pope, and he's being painted as like the family guy now. Elon Musk is like pro-family. Nothing tops the reality that we live in, in terms of just the scope of insanity and, uh, you know, clown worldiness. The, the brave new clown world just keeps breaking new ground in various ways. But that feeling of being alone and isolated is, 
is one of the hardest parts of it for sure even when you come to the place where you're maybe you're entertaining the idea of there being a god in a way that you never did before but there's a big difference between just having the vague idea of a creator or a sovereign ideal or god and whatever you know the type of god that huxley describes in that foreword is the new age one religion it's just whatever god you want the conscious and intelligent pursuit of man's final end the unitive knowledge of immanent tau or logos the transcendent godhead or brahman a higher utilitarianism so when i read stuff like that it's like this to me sounds more like the the synthesis that it's all being designed to kind of bring forth because people we you know we don't want to abandon technology and go live like savages in the woods without electricity and the internet and smart cars and whatever else that's terrifying even like living without Wi-Fi is terrifying. I mean, the whole thing about Brave New World is like how infantilized they all are. And the infantile mindset is, of course, because the state is your, is your daddy. The state is your mommy. The state is your god. And you're to be dependent upon it for everything and all the goods that the collective can manufacture. And so it's, it's a false sense of community, right? It, which we see everywhere we look today in, in the corporate-dominated uh, landscape of, of everything. But what constantly amazes me is how over the past however many years since I started uh, doing this and connecting with more and more people who do see the forest for the trees and do ask the hard questions and do, you know, push against, push against the grain, go against the flow, however you want to say it, and are determined to seek the truth, even if it's um, inconvenient or involves ridicule or persecution or, or what have you. You know, only through going through that journey of feeling like you're the only one, you're the only John Savage, and, you know, you get kind of an Elijah syndrome sometimes, but then being pulled out of that and shown over and over again that there are so many of us out there, even with all the clown world propaganda and brainwashing and worship of, of scientism and, and all the rest, we really are part of a community, but not in the cheesy, overused, uh, cliche, corporate way. But, you know, when you're really clinging to a foundation that is far more secure than the uh, Rosicrucian, esoteric, rehashed sentimentality of, of Shakespeare and all that, but the resurrected and living Christ, then that is where I've just found fellowship and true brothers and sisters that I never imagined I could I could experience those relationships and when the bittersweet side of it though is that you realize that here here we are by the thousands if not millions all over the world and we can connect with each other like never before because of all this crazy technology but if I only have this lifetime to even make what I can out of that then you know what a tragedy that would be to know that there's this huge family of people that you would just give anything <laughs> to be able to just pause all this insanity and pause all this, um, you know, surging forward towards progress and collapse, depending <laughs> on what you want to, what you want to see. But to just be able to all be together in person in some capacity, you know, that would be amazing. And, and that is what I think we're being led to realize that we, we have to do more and we can't just rely on, you know, the internet to be the end all be all even though it's it's this amazing tool but really to me that just points me back towards the incredible unimaginable promise of eternity with Christ and with each other and to have endless amount of time to actually be able to to just enjoy each other's company and eat together and work together and play together and do whatever we all do in the eternal kingdom and overpopulation will not be an issue and Sin will not be an issue, and even that, just trying to imagine that at all kind of breaks your brain. To be able to just enjoy untainted love and fellowship and unity in Christ without the tiniest blemish of sin left in the world. I mean, that, that's more unimaginable than, than anything any of these guys have ever written. And uh, it's interesting because as I was kind of digging into all this Brave New World stuff, some friends of mine who I met, I don't know what year it was, but uh, when I was putting together this uh, kind of a series of videos on Flat Earth testimonies, and I did a separate one for this couple, Dan and Julie, and over the years we've remained friends, and especially through 2020 and all that, you know, both being in the, in the Northwest, I, I did get a chance to hang out with Dan briefly, and it was awesome. But Dan had told me about how Julie was starting her own company, uh, making handmade soap, 
and personal care products and I'd kind of forgotten about it until just recently and you know sent me some soap and then I you know checked out the website and everything and I was like I couldn't believe it I was so blown away by you know what she had just sat down and, and put together with all these different amazing combinations of organic ingredients and oils and things and uh, this charcoal one is pretty awesome I'm loving this one activated charcoal and moringa powder to detoxify and nourish the new man <laughs> and but there's like so many and they all just smell amazing it was a weird moment going like how the heck am i so excited about getting soap from somebody even the packaging man i was just like i felt like bad for opening it because it just looked so so cool like the design of the packaging and everything it's just super cool and it's all made by hand <laughs> with love and so I kind of wanted to share that with you guys because it blessed me and I was like, I think this would bless a lot of other people too. And her bio just says, Hello, I'm Julie. My business, Composure Essentials, aims to provide self-care products for people who care for others to help endure the days and nights with confidence, hope, and joy. I started blending all manner of oils as a massage therapist and nurse's aid to help my clients find relief from a variety of stresses and pain. When my infant daughter developed rashes, I resumed my blending practice and naturally moved into making soaps and lotions. My two older boys and I have enjoyed giving these another handmade gifts as random acts of kindness in our community. I invite you to join us in caring for yourself and others as we explore how to do, give, and be our best every day. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Romans 12.10 And, uh, d dude, I was just, like, so moved by this. And just that verse alone. That's the love that we have in Christ, even now. And it's amazing how something that's seemingly so simple really can just be a, a reminder that I, I need, like, all the time. You know, because I just, I take my eyes off of God, and I start looking at all the the craziness going on in the world. And, um, yeah, so check it out. And I think there's a promo code for the first ten people, but I don't remember what it is. I'll put it on the screen later in post. Here. But overall, I just want to thank all of you guys again for the fellowship that we've been able to, to build over the years for many, many of you and the work that so many people out there are still doing, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's off YouTube, whether it's podcasting or writing articles, sharing information, sharing research, emailing encouragement to one another, building networks everywhere and anywhere we can, meeting with people. I mean, the more I see people doing this, the more it just it, it inspires me. And it did prompt me to want to thank those of you who have chosen to support me at, at any given time through the PayPal, Patreon stuff. I really do appreciate it. So enough about that. All we can do is carry on as the Lord leads and do what he calls us to do and be obedient and allow him to, to reveal the treasures of the people that we encounter along the way. And that's really why we are, are here, after all, is to share the love and, and the grace that, that God has shown us with other people and to invest our time and our energy and our talents in blessing the people around us and caring for those less fortunate than ourselves and remembering that it you know we can't take any of this stuff with us you know all we can do is, is use it for the glory of his kingdom in the days that just pass by so quickly no matter what this life is so fleeting and i'm i feel more and more aware of that lately you know even if all this stuff wasn't going on even if all this great reset technocracy stuff was still the furthest thing from our minds and you know you could just pick a time period in history to just play out your whole life in and sooner or later everyone we know either before you or after you passes on and the relationships that we we built and either maintained or lost in our lifetimes ultimately all are broken by that reality of death what a hopeless final end that really would be for all of us. If it was just, you know, make the best of it while you can. Because you don't know. And, and that's why reincarnation obviously is appealing to a lot of people. Because it just goes on and on forever, right? You don't have to ever say goodbye. But there's no judgment. There's no justice. There's no dealing with the evil in the world. In First Thessalonians 4, verse 13, it says... But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. 
For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore encourage one another with these words. <laughs>